First and foremost, thank you guys all for making the trek out to here today. It means the world to me. Thank you Creative Mornings for reaching out and asking me to speak. Uh, when they emailed me over the topic of wonder, obviously the first thing I did was wonder. What am I, I going to speak about, right? And like any creative, you hear a word and it sparks images in your head. The first few things that popped into my head, Stevie Wonder, as we heard earlier, Wonder Woman, Alice in Wonderland, and Wonder Bread. <laughs> Those were just the first four. Um, and I've always been obsessed with seeing images in my head and then trying to bring them to reality. And I, that, that right there is, is wonder. And just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I was born in Danbury, Connecticut, which is about an hour north of New York City. My father, as you can see here, is a uh, scenic fabricator for Broadway sets. His father did the same thing. His father did, did as well, all the way back to the horse and buggy days. So my earliest memories was this, me standing there wondering, how was this thing created? Who came up with this idea? And what was it going to do? I remember just wandering around in my dad's shop, armed with markers, paint supplies. And I'd find anything I could around on the ground, whether it was a piece of cardboard, a piece of wood, paper. And I'd doodle on it. And I'd try to recreate things that I saw that were being created. To me, that was the first time I was able to wonder, but then also see things that were designed and created on a piece of paper come to reality in real life. There I am in the bottom right corner, wandering around the shop. There's my dad, not paying attention to me, trying to get the job done and make sure the set gets on the trucks and he hits his deadlines. I remember these big cabinets they had that were filled with paint colors. Every single type of paint you can imagine, every color in the spectrum. There was aerosol spray paint, there was bucket paint, there was oil paint. And these scenic painters used to go and they'd pull from these cabinets and they'd have their little sketches. And this was back before they printed, you know, massive backdrops. Everything was painted by hand. You know, ceilings this high, there'd be, there'd be people up in scaffolding painting these intricate backgrounds, whether it, was, whether it was photorealism or it was, you know, something that they just created in their head and brought to life. As I got a little bit older, I got into skateboarding. I love skateboarding. I've been doing it since I was this age. Um, one day for Christmas, I woke up and my dad had built a half pipe in my backyard. It was, it, was, it was all I ever wanted. As you could tell, he didn't really know much about skateboarding because that half pipe, there's no way you could drop in on that thing. <laughs> look, how, look, how steep, look how steep that is and how short it is. <laughs> I don't think I ever dropped in on that thing. I did go back and forth a few times and it made for a great photo op. But it was the thought that counts, right? He had the idea, I had the dream. We wondered how we could make it happen and, and uh, he surprised me with it. This is one of my favorite photos. But growing up, I loved skateboarding. I loved everything about skateboarding. I loved the culture, the clothing. You know, most importantly, when I got my first skateboard, I flipped it over and I saw those graphics and I was just mind blown. You know, the bright colors, the line work, everything was so crisp and it was kind of coming from this surrealistic nature. You know, this, this sense of wonder. I wondered who created these graphics? You know, what did they want to say with them? So I went home and I started drawing these, these, these I tried to recreate all these, um, these graphics that I'd see on, on the skateboards. I'd color them in, I'd get more decks, I'd, I'd, create, I'd uh, draw those as well. And then I got a, a little bit older and I was able to travel a little bit more. And I started going to different cities and I'd go to skate parks. And that's what the first time I saw graffiti. I remember seeing stickers in the skate park plastered all over things. When you go to skate shops, they're handing you stickers. I loved all that stuff. I remember when I was a little kid, I'd take trips into New York City. My dad would be building this, these, these Broadway sets, and we'd go down to, to New York from Connecticut via the Metro North on the train. I'd sit there, I'd peer out the window. I remember seeing Revs and Cost, and they were doing these giant rollers, way bigger than any other graffiti artist would do. And I wondered, how did they do that? Why did they do that? What's the message? 
Whose cost? Whose revs? They had these wheat paste posters all over the city with these cryptic messages, brunch with revs, or brunch with inks. You know, it was just, it was things that just made me wonder. Emit and Jive, they were from Connecticut, two incredible graffiti artists, but I just remember seeing the way that these guys took their letters and they twisted them and made them super unique and they had super awesome, incredible colors and super bold. I started graffiti. The first time I sprayed a can, I was hooked. I loved it. It was incredible. Never felt anything like that. I love that it was so mobile that you could put a can in your backpack. You didn't need to have brushes and waters and whatnot. You could just set up, you could spray, and you could walk away. This is some of my earlier stuff. This was 2003. As you can tell, I've kind of gotten a little bit better since then. <laughs> this says Delt, and this is what we call in graffiti a wild style. But yeah, like anything, you got to start somewhere, right? It's that one element where it starts, and then it grows, and it grows, and it's a snowball effect. Starting with that one idea and wondering how far you could take it. It was time to apply to school. I was in high school. I was drawing some pretty dark stuff. I, uh, my stepdad came to me and he said, you know what, Greg? You can't be a graffiti artist forever. It's all I wanted to do is all I wanted to do is just paint on the streets illegally and sneak out in the middle of the night, write my name on things, do things I probably shouldn't have. It was time to apply to schools. I didn't have a portfolio. I knew that if I went to school, or if I applied to school with my, all the photos I had in shoeboxes of graffiti, there was no way I was getting in. I created an art studio in my parents' garage, armed with art supplies, and I went in there for three months and I just created everything that was inside my head. Again, a lot of it was pretty dark at the time. <laughs> I sent out letters and portfolios to all the schools I dreamed of getting into, and I was like, yeah, I got this, no problem, no problem. Waited a few weeks, the rejection letters started coming in. One, two, three, four. This hurt, you know? You think you got it and you just shut down. You can see what I did to this one rejection letter and the date on this is 1999. I wasn't too happy so I decided to draw a little bird on there. Luckily social media wasn't around at the time so it never ended up anywhere. But I do keep this letter and I still have it to my day in my design studio because it's motivation to me. When one door closes, another door opens. And just because one person tells you you can't do something doesn't mean it's the end of the road or story. I eventually got accepted to Florida State University for studio art and graphic design. I studied graphic design. I learned about you know, color theory. I studied a lot of German graphic design. I was really drawn to that. And I moved to Atlanta after Florida State. I started doing a lot of private label design work commissioned projects for different brands, consulting. I started a clothing line myself and began to travel the world. But there was something that I was missing, you know, that creative energy that, where you can just create for no reason other than satisfying, you know, what you have in your mind. That, like, really exploring that sense of wonder and, and, and bringing that to reality. So after at night I would go and I would go home to my house and finish all my work and I would open up my computer and I would open up my sketchbook and just start drawing at night. And I kept drawing this reoccurring character and I think it was obviously inspired by the skateboard decks, the graffiti, the old cartoons I was watching when I was a kid. And I was creating with just, just for the purpose, the sole purpose to create. And I kept drawing this pop star's character, which I call, and this is the earliest version of the loudmouth icon that you probably are familiar with. It was this chip tooth. The chip tooth was inspired by a near-death story I had in college, just to remind me that life is, isn't always perfect and to you know, seize the opportunity and seize the day. This mouth started showing up on all my drawings for some reason. I don't know why. And then it came time where I was like really just missing getting out and putting work in the public space. So I decided to make a poster and a sticker. I said, hey, why not use the mouth? I mean, it's on all my stuff right now, right? So I made this square Larry Loudmouth icon. I made stickers, I plastered it all over Atlanta. I was sneaking out in the middle of the night again, putting up these wheat pastes that I was creating in my studio. And then I decided one day when I was in the studio at night, I wondered what if this 2D form I had went to more of a 3D form? How could I do that? And this all happened while I was sitting there holding, you know, drinking a soda. 
I looked down at the soda can and I was like, what if I paint this soda can? I'm already drawing this pop star's, you know, character that's basically a soda can. So I painted one. I painted one can. And that night I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning I came home and I finished all my work and I painted a second can. Three, four, painted ten cans. And I, was sta I wasn't telling anybody. And I was stashing them in the closet and I had this closet that I opened up. And I remember I got to like 50 cans and I was like, I just opened it up and all these characters were just staring at me. And I'm like, oh man, I'm creating a cast of these characters. This is crazy. And that's when I felt like there was something there. And I was like, why don't I paint 100 cans? Yeah, it'll take some time, but it's a nice number. It sounds good. It's a good collective of characters. So I painted 100 cans, and I wasn't telling anyone really that I was doing this at the time. And I completed that 100 set, and then I said, I wonder what, what happens if I supersize this thing? So then I made 10 of these large barrels. These are barrels that they ship grains in. It's like a cardboard barrel. I completed those 110-ish cans and, and I thought, okay, now it's, now it's time that I have a, a nice set, a nice body of work to show this work. I had a friend in San Francisco that owned a design agency and art gallery and I uh, reached out to him and he had a gallery space. I sent him some really crappy photos, I remember. I just looked at him the other day and I was like, man, I can't believe I actually sent this off. <laughs> and um, he was like, wow, this is different, this is cool. Yeah, why don't we do a show out here? I'll give you a shot, I'll give you a shot. This is my first show. So, me and Tommy, who sit in the front row from ABV, was my studio assistant at the time. He's been working with me for 10 years. We're like, let's pack this truck up. We rented a U-Haul, attached back to my, on the back of my car. We hopped in and we drove to San Francisco from Atlanta. I think halfway through the trip, we're wondering, was this a good idea? <laughs> what happens if this thing breaks down and we miss the show opening? If we get a flat tire, we're screwed. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't, we didn't think about anything like that. Like, do we give ourselves an extra day in case something goes wrong? If we run out of gas, we would have missed the whole opening. Sure enough, we made it there. It was a long trip, and we didn't kill each other. And uh, we had the show. It was a credible show, sold a ton of work, and this was the first time that I saw that people were interested in the work, and it made people wonder. You know, it took them into, the, into my world. And the, each of these characters told a different story to everyone that looked at it. Over the course of the next 10 years, I took all my characters that I was creating and I started painting more in the public space. Living Walls, a festival that you guys are probably familiar with here in Atlanta, that was the first festival, mural festival that I painted in. Over on DeKalb Avenue was my wall. It's now been redeveloped. But I began painting all over the world. Painting everywhere from Venice Beach to Paris to Miami, all the way over to the Swiss Alps. And this was all from that, that one idea, that show, and using that show to kind of propel my art career. As I was traveling around the world, I was meeting all these different artists. You know, I'm an artist, but I'm also a fan and a collector of other work, work as well. You know, I'm meeting, meeting these artists while I'm traveling, and then I'm also meeting them locally here in Atlanta. And Atlanta's got such an incredible pool of talent. And um, I always thought that, you know, there was a way that I needed to make this bigger than myself. As the work continued to evolve, I remember I was painting in Toronto one day with big teeth. And I was sitting there and I'm thinking to myself, I'm painting this loudmouth character holding a sign. And usually the sign was just something that I said and it was, it was motivational and a thought that I had in my head. And it came, came to life while I was creating the piece. And I didn't ever like fill out the sign until the piece was done. But this time I started thinking, I'm in this other neighborhood. I'm in someone's neighborhood in Toronto that I've never been before. What if I open up this form and I make this more global? So I posted on social media and I said, what should Larry Loudmouth's signs say? All right? This was the first time. And like hundreds and thousands of people started commenting and interacting. And these were just ideas that people had, you know? You know, some were motivational, some were negative. All walks of life, all voices from all around the world. I ended up picking one of the phrases and, and putting it on a sign, and it was stay positive. I always try to make sure that there's a little bit of positive in my work, especially if I'm putting it out in the public world, in the public space. You know, people are so used to just being bombarded by advertising. I think there's something special 
when you could put a message out there and take over a billboard with a phrase that might make you stop, think, wonder, and hopefully something positive. We do the loudmouth says contest now, usually every quarter, and then we pick phrases, usually three phrases, and then those will end up on billboards all over Atlanta. <laughs> and these are all people that submitted. So it's been a really great way to kind of make this thing bigger than me. It started as just me, but then, as and then I, I just kept thinking and thinking, it's, it's not just my message. The minute you put something in the public space, it's, it's everyone's work, right? Everyone has to interact with it. When you're on your way to work, it's just as much my piece as it is yours. So the Loudmouth says allowed to do that, and it's become a bigger voice, and, and the voice of Larry Loudmouth is not just me anymore. By the way, I wasn't really on that billboard, that's Photoshop. My mom got completely freaked out when I posted this on social media. She was like, get down from there. I was like, mom, I'm not really up there. Ash Photoshopped that for me. We recently brought Larry Loudmouth to life and created a mascot character. So you might see him running around at an event near you. He doesn't say much. He speaks through his art. I've always been a firm believer that anything you talk about and put out into the public, public world, you talk it into, into existence, manifesting the destiny. A perfect example of this is I did a solo show in LA recently. Before, I, well I knew I wanted to do a show in LA because I did San Francisco, Miami, Atlanta a few times. It was just the next logical step. I went on social media and I, and I announced I was doing an LA show and I knew I was going to do it in a certain time period. At that point I didn't even have one piece of artwork. I didn't have a venue locked down. I didn't have a title of a show, any of that. But I knew that the minute that I went public with it and announced it, that I would have to hold myself accountable. And that's what I did. So I got in a plane and I flew to LA. I found this space because I, I knew that I wanted to produce it myself because I had a certain vision in my head of what I wanted this show to look like. And then we got to work and I painted 43 pieces. We had the show, it was an incredible turnout and all the work is sold. So that's an example of just, you know, coming up with an idea. And once you start telling people, you don't want to let, you don't, you, you don't want to let yourself down. You know what I mean? So speak it into existence, it works. Ten years ago, I started ABV Gallery and Agency. We're an art gallery in the Old Fourth Ward District, and we represent artists. As I mentioned, I'm meeting all these artists traveling the world, meeting all this incredible Atlanta local talent. I built a platform for myself, and I was like, I need to share this platform. You know, There's so much talent of people that don't have the opportunity to travel to different, different states and witness all this work. And there's people in Atlanta that need a platform to shine on. So I wanted to create something where we could have shows, gallery shows, and work with different brands to create art and connect artists with brands. We currently represent about 300 artists globally. And ABV Agency on the design side has allowed me to kind of create ideas and then bring them to life. The same way when I was a little kid and I used to walk into my dad's wonderland and I was just blown away seeing these little sketches turn into reality. One example is this. This is what we call the live art pyramid. This was an idea that I drew on a napkin when I was talking to my brother one night. You know, I was going to all these music festivals and I'm seeing these huge elaborate stages that these DJs are performing on, these bands are performing on, and all these music festivals that claim that they're a music and arts festival. And I go to the, I go to the festival and I go, where's the art, right? You know, they're just kind of using the name Arts Festival just to kind of attract the public. So to me, I was like, we don't want to just have a little canvas in the corner and an artist painting on it. How do we give them something unique, something that's 360 that you can walk around, something that's, you know, multidimensional, a unique shape, multiple canvases? This was one of those ideas. And the first time we did it, it was, it was almost a massive failure. I almost quit, but I didn't. 
This was probably the third or fourth one that we did. We perfected it. And then it ended up on the front page of the New York Times business section. This had 12 canvases that were painted over a three-day period. And then the canvases went up for auction after it. But again, it's just that having that little idea, wondering how far you can push it, but then not giving up on that idea until you make it a reality. Five years ago in Atlanta, I felt there was a need for a festival that was both music, skateboarding, action sports, and art. I found it, I, it's a little loud. I'll let this play for a minute. So yeah, that slide wasn't supposed to come up yet. <laughs> but Outer Space Project was a, was a way that we could bring more art to the streets in Atlanta. Atlanta is constantly changing. The landscape's constantly being developed. But I felt there was a need that I could probably leave a little bit more of a legacy in the city, add a little bit more art to make your days more exciting when you're on your way to work, wherever you might be going. And we produce, we produce 16 murals with that a year. And if there's anything at the end of the day that I can leave you with is I really, really, really hope you don't ever lose your sense of wonder. Because you never know where it could take you. Thank you, guys.